growing up in Montclair, New Jersey, I was contacted by uh, an alumnus who was returning for what Cornell used to call subfrosh weekend. Anyway, he was uh, headed back to Ithaca for a weekend and had been instructed to uh, bring back a couple of promising high school students. And by the time we returned to Montclair on Sunday, I didn't want to go to school anyplace else. Looking back on it now, we really did have a sort of warped sense of what was really important back in those days. Uh, we spent most of our time worrying about grades and women. And I don't worry about grades anymore. Uh, I still remember them saying at the initial meeting, look to the left, look to the right. Only one of the three of you is going to be here at graduation. Of course, what I found out very quickly was that the only course that anybody really cared about was design. And so all the other courses were sort of uh, stuff that we needed to do. And I'm convinced that what binds us all together and gives us such warm feelings about our undergraduate days is the shared misery of it all. I've been working with, uh, with Peter and what the firm has evolved into uh, now since 1963. Uh, Cornell has historically been a fairly steady client of ours, although they don't really give us their glorious projects to work on. Uh, they, they give us the ones where they, they need good results but don't need a signature product. Many of the projects that we've done at Cornell are projects that are really, you have to see them from inside. Um, probably the most unusual and noteworthy of them is the attic of Rockefeller Hall. We also did the same kind of renovation in Goldwyn Smith the admissions center and uh, the Binnencorp Auditorium are kind of interesting spaces. We've won three AIA National Design Awards for buildings that we've done in College Town. They're relatively small, multi-use buildings. The Crescent Building, which is the building that we're sitting in, is, is sort of an interesting building. We doubled the amount of area by hanging the second floor in the existing space, which uh, enabled us to put our offices on the second floor and um, downstairs is doctor's offices and some other commercial uh, spaces, but certainly made it economically viable. We've designed uh, about 11 new buildings and probably $100 million worth of work on the, on the Ithaca College campus. Most uh, memorable of those are three buildings that were just recently finished. One is the new School of uh, uh, Health Science and Human Performance. Then there's also a new science building we just did the James Whelan uh, Music Building, which is their Music and Performing Arts Building, and the Roy H. Park School of Communications. I guess in 1998, um, I decided to sell my portion of the firm to my partners uh, and just to work for them part-time. When I'm here, I come to work on a, on a regular basis. I come in in the morning. I decide to go home when I'm tired, which I normally find is after everybody else in the office has already gone home. Um, but I feel free to take off a month three times a year and, and take a trip or just goof off. Since 1958, I've actually even learned to like winter. Uh, I ski now, I love to fish. This is a great place when, when I retired, we, we, we talked about where we wanted to live, and it was a very short discussion. We decided that you know, we're going to stay here and just go other places on vacation. Um, you know, during the 10th month of winter, it's sometimes nice to get away and go someplace where it's warm. Uh, but it's hard to believe that there's any place that's, that's prettier or the, the people friendlier than they, than they are here. Atlantic City, New Jersey, when every night 
we were down there, I would take a walk on the boardwalk five miles uh, northward from Ventnor to uh, uh, the uh, um, ski ball machines. And uh, all and looming in the distance all the way up the, the boardwalk was the Tremor Hotel. That was uh, always held a fascination for me. And uh, so when it became, when it came time to, to choose a, uh, a direction, uh, I f figured, well, architecture might do it for me. It was a matter of <sighs> serendipity. Uh, what architecture schools were out there that were within striking distance of Philadelphia with uh, an automobile. Um, and at that time, there was train service. I remember that. I took the train up and back a few times. I went to, uh, started Cornell. I knew Bupkis about architecture. I had not a clue about anything. Uh, it, was an, it, was an, it was an abstract notion in my, my head uh, about what an architect did. Um, and what architectural education was all about. Actually, I found a refuge uh, in uh, the music room, in the Strait. I felt that I was somewhat of an outsider, and that, that place was in, inhabited by outsiders. Uh, Christmas break, fifth year, I got a camera. And uh, um, I, bought, you know, I got a roll of film when I bought the camera, and then uh, started walking around the city taking pictures. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it was a revelation to me that you could actually uh, uh, create an instant. Uh, and I began to realize that uh, architecture doesn't, you know, begin with that, you know, shovel in the ground to uh, make this uh, abstract building uh, in a and abstract landscape. Uh, and it exposed me to the whole uh, 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 process that leads up to the, uh, the formulation of a building project. Um, and it also exposed me to the, uh, the, 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 the element of the equation that uh, was humanity. What really precipitated the formation of Friday was uh, the, uh, we placed third in the national competition, the Thousand Oaks Civic Center competition in uh, Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, and uh, the four of us, Arlene and I and Peter and David, worked on that competition. And we felt that the, 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 uh, the chemistry was such uh, that, uh, that we felt that could sustain uh, and in fact, that was that were the work that we produced uh, was uh, recognized by some people uh, to have value. Uh, we felt, well, well, let's give it a, a, a shot. All of this, these these client groups that we had taught us how to work in, in groups, taught us how to work with non-professionals, where the where the resulting design looked nothing like anybody would have predicted going in. And that it was clearly not the product of any one person's uh, uh, aesthetic or uh, sensibilities. And, and, and it was a camel. Uh, what, uh, is that, uh, what, uh, what's the definition of a camel? Well, that, uh, it's a horse designed by committee. So, well, that, and, and we, Found out we really like camels, you know, camels are okay. For the last 10 years or so, I've been in a writer's group, and for the last few years of that, uh, I went back to my old images, the old pictures I took uh, in New York and uh, uh, other and around, around here, around Philadelphia, and began to uh, write about them. Uh, about my impressions of the images, of the experience of taking the picture, of what I was thinking when I saw that particular scene, uh, and my thoughts about what it is 
to me now. And uh, I'm really uh, enjoying that process. to Cornell because I grew up in Detroit and I didn't want to go to the University of Michigan and my parents were from the East and they thought I should go to a good school which meant one in the East and I had kind of wanted to go to art school um, but my parents certainly did not think that was a good idea so I, I um, started at Cornell in 61 as an arts um, matriculator and somehow during that first semester, somebody sent me on an errand to Whitehall to give a note to one of the architecture students. And I went up there in the attic of Whitehall and I saw all these people doing wonderful drawings and getting a degree from a good university. So I said, you know, I think I'd like to transfer into this. If I had to sum up my feelings about the, the architecture school, I don't remember a lot of teacher role models. But what, I, what was really was fabulous were the other students and the upperclassmen. And I remember just hanging out, and we were pretty collegial, and everybody did a lot of work in the studio, and then you'd go through the other studios and see what the third year students were doing, and it was just so impressive. I mean, I think most of what I learned at Cornell, I learned from the, the other architecture students. Maybe the end of third, fourth, and fifth year, when the Texas people came, that when Werner came and John Shaw, that we really thought, wow, these people are teachers. Those were the first times I remember somebody telling me to go to the library and look at how so-and-so had solved an entrance problem. And it began to make sense to me. But up to then, I was really looking at what other students had done. Every student in our class was smart. Uh, maybe they weren't all equally facile, but everybody in that class was really smart. So it was an amazing place. I worked one summer while I was still a student at a big architecture firm in my hometown of Detroit. And um, it was such an awful experience. I was the only woman out of about 200 people. And no one spoke to me, I mean, the whole summer that I decided then that I could never work for a large firm. And I, I held to that for the rest of my life, actually. Then in 1970, well, Don came, Don came out to start the firm by himself. I stayed working until I was uh, nine months pregnant, nine months minus one week. And uh, then I really worked a little bit part-time. I did a lot of teaching in the 70s. I taught at uh, Philadelphia College of Art. I taught at evenings at Drexel. We juggled the kids and traded them off with people. It was a different world. There were, you know, it was before daycare. And, uh, and then I came back to the office full time in 1979. And by that time I had a pretty good sized residential practice. So I brought it with me and it was kind of a word of mouth residential practice. And sometimes I had enough to hire someone and sometimes I didn't, but, and it's sort of remained that way for the last 20 years. And it's a, it's a very gratifying aspect of, of my work because it's so immediate. I mean, you can get a project built and decorated in less than a year. Whereas an average school project that we would, might do is, um, is, is four years, maybe, three or four years. Some of them are five years. The idea of doing residential is really fun. I've met a lot of wonderful people. It's, it's a different kind of client. Although now in the, in the 90s, I have to say, it's, well, we've been doing more private school work, our clients have been really great. And it's, it's been a good mix. I mean, I like being on the boards. I can't wait till it starts to look good. I love that part of the process of architecture. And that has remained all these years my favorite part, I have to admit, except for going to the celebration openings. Well, I've been at Drexel since 1970. I started teaching at Drexel the same year the office started, and the same year we had our first baby. It was quite a bonanza year. Sometimes I think you manufacture an hour of teaching out of just thin air. But it really, for me, it's what I do in my other time, my work. That's what I'm bringing, my, and my life. 
and how you balance your work and your life. And that's what you're trying to show other people. And maybe that's what I meant when I thought Cornell, but I think I watched how people lived more than I really listened to what they were telling me about making buildings. <laughs>
wasn't wasn't uh, wasn't in the experience. So, um, but we had our fair share of it at Cornell. We started. We rode out across the lake, and then we had about a half a mile to row back, which was uh, longer than ever done before. And the uh, the coach was in this little launch and behind the uh, the boats out on the lake, and with his megaphone, kind of uh, giving you know instructions. And I remember just getting rowing and rowing, and it just felt totally exhausted. Like there was no way I could po you know even do one more stroke. And he goes, "Okay, guys, you're doing great. That's halfway." So. <laughs> Um, and the reason I think about that forever since then was just the, the notion of like, well, where do you get the energy to continue the other half, and yet somehow you do. I guess I wanted to be an architect from the time I was about 10 years old. Um, my, um, my father uh, saw me sketching the building across the street and uh, said, well, why don't you design your own? And I sort of started sketching and he came back and said, this is what architects do, maybe you want to be an architect. So I said, yeah, I'm going to be an architect. I applied to four schools. I went to Cornell because I didn't get into Yale. I think almost everybody I knew at Cornell, not just in architecture, was a reject from Yale, Harvard, or Princeton. I can remember the, uh, the fat envelope in the mailbox. That was, I think, one of the most exciting events of my entire childhood was finding the fat envelope from Cornell in the, in the mailbox. I had never imagined that I would even leave home to go to school uh, because almost everybody I knew was going to school at Queens or Brooklyn or City or um, Yeshiva or whatever. And so going away at the age of literally just under 17 uh, was uh, quite an extraordinary, exciting experience. Uh, I think the only person who ever gave me any decent criticism was Tom Canfield. I think, uh, and, and I remember one particular thing that he said to me, he said, uh, which probably has something to do with my interest in facade design now, he said, uh, on, a, on a vertical surface you have three variables. You have plane, you have color, and you have material. And if you change one, you've got an articulation. If you change two, you've got a really important articulation. And if you change three of them, you have a mistake. I really think that, that uh, Colin Rowe's arrival at Cornell was, a, was an incredible turning point. Uh, I realized by the time I graduated that, you know, 95% of what I learned about architecture, about theory, about design, about the culture of architecture, um, I had learned in my fifth year. And I went off to uh, uh, to Rome in the spring of, uh, of well, Italy, actually, most of it in Rome, in the spring of 76, uh, to work on Giuseppe Tirani and, and the Dantem project, which eventually became the book Il Dantem di Tirani, uh, published in 1980, and then in 85 uh, in English as the, the Dantem. Uh, and that's really when I, I, I realized that um, uh, after doing some social science research at, at Princeton and working with a sociologist and writing criteria for housing for the elderly and the like, I realized at that, at that point that I was more interested in history and theory. And so I threw myself into that and, and, and got involved with Tirani, eventually producing two books on Tirani, published in both languages. And then ev eventually wound up in 1984 at, uh, at the University of Maryland, where I, I've been since, since then. Uh, so my, my book came, my first book came out in 85 in English, and then uh, in 91 uh, I published Surface and Symbol, Giuseppe Tirani and the Architecture of Italian Rationalism, uh, uh, which, um, uh, and when it came out I was in Italy again. Uh, in, 90, in, in 91, uh, uh, Werner Seligman, who was the dean at the time at, 
at Syracuse, asked me to come teach at Syracuse in Florence. And then when he stepped down as dean and Bruce Abbey took over, Bruce also invited me uh, to come back. So I've been, during the 1990s, I spent four years in Florence, which was another very interesting experience. So with all of this um, serious uh, scholarship and uh, teaching and all that, my real passion is actually architectural humor. Um, uh, this, uh, what you see here is a, uh, a little uh, piece of a manuscript uh, of a little, uh, I don't know what you call it, a pamphlet, I suppose, uh, which I call the Piano Nobile and Other Instruments concerning some very important architectural matters. And in it, uh, I've got some articles, uh, humor pieces, uh, like the House of Tevia, uh, which is an architectural analysis of Tevia's famous song, If I Were a Rich Man, uh, from Fiddler on the Roof. This is the stuff I'm really most proud of. What, what are the important things in my life, uh, at least professionally and academically? Getting into Cornell, uh, being a Collins student in grad school, and uh, getting a Rome Prize and going to Italy for two years were clearly the most important. And I think probably in, in more or less an equal measure, uh, something w I did when I was a kid. I gave it up in architecture school because I didn't have any time for it. Uh, and then 30 years later, at the age of 47, picked it up again like an alcoholic taking a drink. And uh, I went back uh, to playing golf, and uh, I'm playing better than I ever did when I was a kid. age of 13, I decided, I'm sure with some influence from my father, that I wanted to be an architect. Not that I really had any idea of what an architect was. Actually, I didn't know what Cornell required but uh, at that point. However, about my second year, my father had the fellowship for a, a second and then a third year. So we were actually in Rome for three years at the American Academy. And about the second year, this um, tall, blonde, young guy, about 22. He had just graduated from Cornell and he was very dramatic. Um, he was like a, he looked like a Viking. And uh, when he found out that I wanted to go into architecture, he told me, in his usual way, that I had to go to Cornell. There was no question about it. Back then, in 1958, um, girls were in the dormitories. And although the guys could stay and, um, in the drafting room, I had to trek back to, uh, to Dixon Hall with a big, heavy wood drafting board, my T-square, my triangles, my pencils, all of those things, back and forth every single day uh, because as most Cornelians know, the lights don't go out in, uh, in the architecture department. People work through the night. In fact, I remember freshman year, um, I remember the phone rang and the girls knocked on the door and I was asleep. They knocked on the door and they told me that I was wanted on the telephone. And I went to the phone, which was hanging on the corridor wall. I picked it up. I said, I'm sleeping, and I fell flat on my face. And everybody heard the phone <laughs> going back and forth that came out. Uh, but, um, you know, a lot of sleepless nights. I think my record was 64 hours without sleep. Before we went out and we told people at Cornell that we were going to go to California, everybody said, you're going to San Francisco, aren't you? And we said, no, we're going to L.A. They said, How could you go to L.A.? You know, it's, it's all flat. It's, uh, people wear gas masks. They painted this horrible story. I was doing this design with the head of the design at that time, um, 
of a plastic surgeon's office, and this, the plastic surgeon had hired an interior designer who, who drove a Rolls Royce. And he came by, and he said, and he looked at us, he said, you know, he said, I don't know how to draft, he said, but I have ideas. And I thought to myself, I think I have ideas too. I mean, I didn't really want to be typecast as an interior designer, but nobody was paying for the architecture. So little by little, I found, I started doing the interiors. There was a certain point after working eight years there, I realized I had hit the glass ceiling. And uh, so I went out on my own, first working from my apartment with kids screaming around. <laughs> And then I opened a little office and down in Santa Monica, and that's when I did this Oxnard dental suite. So I designed this dental suite as a spaceship. Little by little, I realized after, what is it, 30, 40 years of practice uh, and being married in the traditional way, I had never ever really just been a wife or at home. And uh, so now one of the rooms is my office there, and that's where I practice. And I do occasional work. I don't solicit work anymore. Probably about 12, 13 years ago, I became fascinated with orchids. Right now, what my interest is when I get some time uh, is to photograph orchids. The professors. I recall made it clear that we were going to get married, have children, and that they were wasting their time on us. The fact is we all got married for some weird reason to Cornell Architects. We each had two children, but we all practiced. I'm Clark Halstead, and this is Halstead's Real Estate Review on 96.3 FM WQXR. Uh, um, I was fascinated by um, drawing pictures of houses and perspectives and things like that. And I guess uh, my father was a doctor, and um, I, I guess that I was, you know, in the grip of a kind of um, tradition where one had to learn a trade uh, um, and you had to go to school to do something more than study uh, liberal arts. So I applied to various schools of architecture and um, I went happily off to Cornell. You know, I, I went off to Cornell without a clue of what it was about. And I recall very well the um, matriculation um, meeting in, in um, this auditorium. I suppose that was in, was in the old building, I think, yeah. And um, whoever, uh, you know, gave this very encouraging greeting uh, said, um, look to your left and look to your right. Four out of five of you will not be here. Uh, five years from now, and um, well, I just shuddered and you know shook in my boots and um, wondered what in the world I was doing here. And so I would say it went straight downhill from there. <laughs> I also had um, some fun on the swimming team and for for the first couple of years I was on the swimming team. The natural environment there was beautiful, and I and I always loved that. I guess that proves that I had that before I went there, that appreciation for the visual. I, I got a job with a wonderful, um, um, prestigious consulting firm called Landauer Associates, which is in real estate. It was something in those days very high-toned, like um, McKinsey or Booz Allen, but just in, in real estate. And uh, stayed there for a long time. And, and um, it learned everything that there was to know about real estate and had, you know, a really terrific experience. And I was then recruited away from that to start 
uh, Sotheby's uh, real estate division. I went to Tuxedo Park and um, listed a house there. He was a nice man and he was the um, account executive at Ogilvy and Mather uh, for the Hathaway shirt account. And so at that particular time they were trying to find a replacement. And so his wife was there, standing there as we were talking about this, and she said, well, why don't you ask him? <laughs> and so that's how I got the job. <laughs> I um, used my Columbia Business School um, training and put together a business plan. Um, went to visit uh, venture capitalists and uh, got funding to start this company. And one of the things that I did in opening up here was to get uh, London taxi uh, limousines, Austins, um, with the logo on the side and um, that became our tra trademark. We became um, about the 50th largest real estate brokerage company in America, uh, fastest growing um, from scratch ever anywhere in a major metropolitan area. And uh, last year we sold about a billion three hundred thousand million, uh, a billion three of uh, residential real estate, and we have about three hundred and fifty people that work here and and in our offices on the eastern end of uh, Long Island. And um, just last spring, I sold the company to a group of investors, and uh, now I am uh, uh, I am on board as uh, chairman and founder uh, on a consulting contract and um, am luxuriating in the, um, in the land of what I call vestigial marginality. Uh, it was one of the few that passed all of the exams on the first time. And, uh, but mostly not because of brilliance, just because of hard work and I wanted out. And um, so incredibly today I still have a, a, a license to practice architecture because the continuing ed program, weak as it is, has not caught up with me yet. And why did I do that? Because it was so difficult uh, to get there. <laughs> and um, I keep doing it year after year and I put it on my card. Uh, photography, of course, is, is, is a very, um, you know, visual thing. It's a way of turning um, uh, something that you see into a set piece um, without really modifying it but capturing it in a way that you can then um, review it um, on a uh, you know, frequent basis every time you look at the photograph. Uh, to me the natural environment is the winner of all grand prizes. I'm Clark Halstead, founder of the Halstead Property Company and this is Halstead's Real Estate Review. wanted me to be an engineer and I didn't want to be an engineer so you know we went to a counselor you know and then they decided I had uh, artistic uh, possibilities therefore they you know one of the choices would have been architecture among other things and uh, that's how it was decided it, it's not that uh, you know in, in our not not now but in, at that time it was decided for you the reason I went to Cornell is because I wanted to study art. My father is an engineer, and I wanted to study architecture. Then, the way it's in Puerto Rico, it's not like in the States where you go and visit schools. My father decided I was going to Cornell because he knew somebody who went to Cornell, and that was it. Of course, you, you know, in, in, in Cornell, I have lots, lots of fond memories of everybody, lots of professors which I was very uh, fond of. Uh, of course, number one is Mr. Kira, uh, who was, we were kinship, and because he was always very elegant and very dapper with his pocket handkerchief and uh, his accent. Of course, uh, Colin Rowe, who was my thesis advisor, uh, who, who is, uh, I treasure everything he taught me, and I distinctly remember once we, we got to know each other, he invited me 
to one of his breakfasts in uh, a Sunday breakfast and he served me gin <laughs> and I had to stagger home and sleep for the whole day. <laughs> it was fantastic. Uh, and some of you may remember that I did that famous uh, nude sculpture <laughs> based on the Donatello's David, but I was wearing my derby hat, and which uh, you wore. I was one of the few who had wore hats in school. <laughs> I also had my blue poncho that was also very well known around uh, uh, the campus. Remember when I used to coordinate my presentations with my outfits? Yeah, if I, I, I did one when I, was, when I was in blue, I did it in blue boards with white, with white ink, and the whole thing, I would show up, you know, my present, that was another thing which was fun, I would work at home so nobody would see my work, and then I would rush in a taxi at the last moment, and there it was a ba-ba, it was a big uh, surprise. I am on my own, alone. I have an office. I am the secretary. I am the accountant. I am the uh, typist. And um, the only thing I don't do is I do not draft. I still work by freehand. And then I have somebody who comes in, takes my sketches, and then he uh, drafts them in AutoCAD. I don't like AutoCAD. <laughs> I do most of the high-end uh, residential projects and for these people who are very well off and I do their apartments in New York, I do their houses, I do their beach houses, I do their yachts, I do their... Uh, I, I'm doing, I did a house in Santo Domingo, which is like a third home, it's, uh, and uh, they fly me back and forth in, in planes, you know, and uh, so in my work, uh, all the accessories and all the artwork is either chosen by me or commissioned by me. And uh, I even um, now I, I have a friend who's a singer, Lucecita Benitez, and I just did her album cover. Uh, it's called Renacer. And uh, now I'm getting very involved in the uh, music business, uh, in the art part of the music business because of that. I just did a house where uh, um, I, w I bought this fabulous book about this zone. Zodiac. So when it was time to design the screen, I decided I wanted to do the Zodiac. I write for the newspaper. I wrote a column uh, on anything I wanted because, again, it's, they give me the liberty. They have to give me the liberty. So I would write on design, I, anything that had to do with architecture. I can, and again, because I'm alone in my office, I can shut the office and go to Portugal for a month, you know, rent a villa. Uh, if I had an office, I couldn't do that because they would be stealing from me or they would be doing nothing, you see, at the time. I was being true to myself, you know, so I don't. And Cornell let me be. You see, they didn't try to uh, change me or anything like that, which was also wonderful about that. That's one of the things. Cornell gives you a lot of liberty to express yourself any way you want. My clothing, I was famous for my, my outfits and uh, because I designed them and uh, I would wear them. I, I could dare to wear them because people didn't, people were less uh, uh, out about things. And uh, so I was, uh, and the, a lot of people admired me for that because I was my, myself. I didn't try to conform. No, no, I'm not famous. I'm just famous in Puerto Rico. I'm a big frog in a small pond.